So there's this concern in American churches, it seems, with being apostolic. Sometimes we drive past church signs and they say, the holy apostolic church. There is uh, this underlying need to be identified with the apostles. And it's a very noble and uh, understandable thing to want within your church. Uh, I, my family comes from a Church of Christ background in which they are attempting to restore Christianity, the restorationists. They want to get back to whatever the apostles were doing in the first century. So when we consider the problem of the Trinity, the question we should ask is, who was the first Trinitarian? And can we locate that person amongst the apostolic faith? Of course, the answer is absolutely not. The citation of various uh, pre-fourth century church fathers as evidence of a uh, continuous stream of Trinitarianism is an absolute misconception. What we do find, at least I find, in my conversations with the, the ordinary Christian, when I say that placing the doctrine of the Trinity in the first century is an anachronism, they begin to cite various figures such as, they say, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, they all called Jesus God. But calling Jesus God is by no means evidence of Trinitarianism, much less that there has been some unbroken stream of Trinitarianism emanating out of the apostolic era, era and into the fourth century. That narrative is, of course, what certain figures, certain uh, ancient historians such as Eusebius of Caesarea would wanted us to believe. There was an active process of whitewashing to make it seem as if Trinitarianism had simply always been around. But if we look carefully, certain phrases and, and ideas that we do find in the pre-fourth century church fathers are simply misunderstandings. While we have Justin Martyr and Irenaeus and others using the word God of Jesus, they use it in a very broad sense. Irenaeus, for example, will say, There are none who are called God uh, except the Son and those who possess the adoption. That would be Christians. So we continuously encounter the breadth of the application of the word God. And it is not something revered to someone who has a, uh, yeah, is the eternal logos. I would say that we can't consider anyone, any theology Trinitarian unless it exhibits at least the, the core fundamentals of Trinitarianism. I would say that the core fundamentals would be a belief in f at least three persons, and those persons must be uh, co-equal, and it must have eternally been that way. So without, without evidence of three co-equal, co-eternal persons, we don't have the Trinity. So if we cannot find that in any source before the first century, then we shouldn't say this is fair evidence of Trinitarianism especially when those fathers say things that are quite contrary. Until the, what has been called the Arian controversy, uh, before the rise of the Proto-Orthodox party in the early 4th century in Alexandria, we have uh, a subordinationist view as holding the mainstream qualification in Christendom. Subordinationism, meaning that the Son is subjected to the Father, both in nature and in being. The Son is somehow derived from, dependent upon, God the Father. So the view that Athanasius and Alexander label as Arian is, has really nothing to do with Arius. It's a much older view. In fact, in the Arian controversy, Arius himself 
cites the ancient fathers, Origen, Tertullian, these were the people, these were the great figures that he could draw upon. And he claimed that his doctrine was traditional, and he was right. Was it the oldest one? I don't think so. But it certainly was not Trinitarian. And we can argue then that Athanasius and Alexander as well were not quite Trinitarian themselves, even at the, at the opening of the fourth century, even at Nicaea. We, if, until we have an eternal son, and I would argue also an eternal third person, then there can, there's no possibility for a trinity. But we find that Origen in the third century is the first one to even mention an eternal generation of the son. However, Origen still believes that the son is still a creature. He takes creation and puts all of creation into this eternal present so that the father does not have to change and go from non-creating to suddenly creating. It's a very Platonic God. It is not until the Alexandrians build upon Origen's third century work and begin to really push the eternal generation of the sun that we have a real blurring of the lines between them. But there's a problem. Athanasius has a serious, a serious issue on, he, on his hands once he asserts that the Father and the Son are of the same substance. Inevitably, what Nicaea led to was a presentation of God and His Son as one hypostasis, language that would later absolutely be defined as meaning one person. Nicaea presents no solution for how the Father and the Son are distinct. And it's not until the arrival of the Cappadocian Fathers, some very brilliant gentlemen, to come up with a compromise solution. They want to equally avoid Jewish monotheism, that's Unitarian monotheism. They want to equally avoid polytheism. They also are afraid of being pushed into the Sabellian view, which states that God is only one hypostasis, as demonstrated at Nicaea. And they also wanted to avoid the Arian view that they are distinct. So they have, all this, they have several balancing games that they're trying to play. And they come up with an ingenious formula, one essence and three hypostasis, three persons and one God. And it is not until 381 at the Council of Constantinople that this doctrine is asserted by the point of the sword, I might add, in the, in, into mainstream Christian thought. But even then, we have reports of riots in the streets in the eastern half of the empire over the introduction of this new formula. Various other bishops... Marcellus of Ancyra, for example, protest this new formula as borrowing from the Valentinian Gnostics, but to no avail. Emperor Theodosius cements this idea into the Christian consciousness. And it's, it's inaccurate then to say that Trinitarianism, again, which, is the, which, is, which requires three co-eternal co-equal persons. It's inaccurate to say that that existed, especially that it was held as orthodox until the late 4th century.